Kinabalu, the highest mountain in Borneo. Its mist-wreathed peaks, a place of legend and fable. To the ancestors of the Kadazan people that still live around its slopes, it was the abode of the spirits of the dead. And to Chinese adventurers of the Ming dynasty, the dwelling place of a great dragon, rumored to live on the shores of a mighty lake at the very summit of the mountain, guarding a priceless pearl. Today, we know that there are no pearls, only coins thrown in by climbers. A lingering remnant, perhaps, of a belief in the need to appease the spirits. The lake is just a tiny pool, nestling in the rocks below the highest peak, and there may never have been a dragon. Certainly, the many hundreds who now climb the mountain each year have yet to see one, at large on the crest of Kinabalu. But beneath these granite peaks, there are other sites almost as strange. Kinabalu is the highest point between the Himalayas and New Guinea, a temperate island rising over 4,000 meters from the surrounding sea of humid lowlands. Its cloud-drenched flanks support some of the richest mountain forests in the world, a treasure house of plant and animal life to rival any legend. Today, you can drive to Kinabalu from the coast in two hours. But when it was first climbed in 1851 by a British colonial officer, Hugh Lowe, he took several days to reach even the foot of the mountain. Lowe followed the Tempasak River to the village of Kial. There, he obtained guides for the climb. On the second morning out from the village, his journal records a fine view of a waterfall ascending the opposite spur of the mountain. It appeared to have a fall of at least six or seven hundred feet of perpendicular descent. After breakfasting on cold rice and sardines, and finishing a cigar, Lowe pressed on upwards, botanizing as he went. Two nights he spent damp and shivering under rock overhangs, the higher Packer Cave, the furthest point then known to his Kadazan guides. From there he climbed up through a steep and tedious thicket to see the naked summit of the mountain before him. Low reached the base of two of the great pinnacles that ring the upper reaches of Kinabalu. On scrambling up between them, he was astonished, he tells us, to find not the flat tableland that he'd expected, but a circular amphitheatre ringed with overhanging precipices, the bottom of which, from its great depth, was undiscernible. After finishing, a bottle of excellent Madeira to Her Majesty Queen Victoria's health and that of far distant friends, he was overtaken by a thick Scotch mist and beat a cautious retreat.
Lowe left the mountain dissatisfied with what he'd achieved. He returned again twice more in 1858 with his friend Spencer St John, the British consul in Brunei. Between them, they laid the foundations of our knowledge of Kinabalu's unique flora. Many of the mountain's most striking plants bear Lowe's name. There's a Lowe's rhododendron. A Lowe's pitcher plant, of which the botanist Sir Joseph Hooker wrote, a very elegant claret jug might be made of this shape. And from moist hollows in the barren rock of the upper slopes, Lowe's buttercup. Both Lowe and St John are remembered by features of the mountain itself. There's a St John's Peak amongst these rocky summits. The highest point on the mountain is called Lowe's Peak. But what lies beyond is his most dramatic memorial the great cleft that splits Kinabalu almost in half, Lowe's Gully. What caused this massive rift in the mountain isn't known for certain. But other aspects of Kinabalu's history are better understood. The mountain is a huge plug of granite thrust up through the surrounding sedimentary rocks. This may have happened as little as one and a half million years ago, which makes Kinabalu perhaps the youngest non-volcanic mountain in the world. Less than 10,000 years ago, the top of the mountain was glaciated. The rocks still bear the imprint of the ice. The summit plateau was worn smooth by the passage of the glaciers. It can still freeze up here at night, and only a few degrees drop in the average temperature would bring the return of an ice cap to this tropical mountain. As the glaciers cascaded down to melt in the warmth of the lowlands, they gouged deep furrows between the peaks. Only the highest of these pinnacles remained above the dome of ice that once blanketed the mountain. Though many are drawn here just by the challenge of climbing the highest point in Borneo, Kinabalu has more to offer than the sculpted rockscapes of the summit plateau. The forests below are an equal source of inspiration. Many of the plants that adorn these forests are found nowhere else in the world. Others have affinities with the flora of the far distant Himalayas, yet others with Australia and even New Zealand. And the greatest puzzle of all, some are living fossils, scores of times older than the mountain itself. Among the more spectacular of the mountain's flowers are the rhododendrons, a group better known perhaps from China and the Himalayas, although they extend through Southeast Asia to New Guinea. There are 24 species here, that's half of all the rhododendrons found in Borneo, and five of them are unique to Kinabalu. They range in size from the great trusses of Lowe's rhododendron, as much as two hand spans across, to the fingernail-sized trumpets of this heather-like rhododendron from the upper reaches of the mountain. 
It's found nowhere else in the world. The form in which they grow varies too. Some are compact bushes on the ground. Others perch high up in the forest canopy. Their stems are rooted in the luxuriant moss that clothes the bark of the trees in these moist middle levels of the mountain. This is another of the species unique to Kinabalu. It grows almost to the summit of the mountain. This rocky rhododendron studded landscape could almost be in the Himalayas. And there are other plants here that wouldn't look out of place in the mountains of Asia or even Europe. A potentilla or sankfoil. And although it's white rather than blue, unmistakably a gentian. These alpine plants share the upper levels of the mountain with others of very different affinities. Red sanicle, for instance, with relatives in Australia. But all, whatever their origins, require the cool, temperate climate that mountain living brings. They can't survive in the humid heat of the surrounding lowlands. So, how did they reach Kinabalu? For tens of millions of years, the central spine of Borneo was much higher than it is today, high enough to support an extensive alpine flora. Slowly, its soft sedimentary rocks were eroded. But as these ancient mountains wore down towards the lethal heat of the lowlands, Kinabalu was thrust up through them, just in time to afford a refuge to plants that need the coolness of altitude to survive. And that helps to explain, too, how Kinabalu is home to living fossils, such as the celery pine, perhaps the most primitive of all living conifers. The celery pine shares the mountain forests with another living fossil, the trig oak, first discovered on Kinabalu, and as recently as 1961. The trig oak fills a missing link between the oaks and the beeches. It has the leaves of a tropical oak, but the triangular nuts of the beech. Though these are born in acorn-like cups. Accidents of past history, together with the great range of living conditions that high mountains afford, have endowed Kinabalu with one of the world's richest floras. It's nurtured and watered by the tropical rain, some five meters a year. High on the mountain, there's no soil to absorb it, so the rain runs off almost at once from this impervious granite shield. Lower on the mountain, the runoff is more gradual. 
The vegetation acts as a sponge, soaking up the water to release it slowly, drop by drop. The absorbent qualities of the forest do much to soften what would otherwise be a savage regime of sudden floods and arid interludes. These sodden, mossy banks are an ideal home for plants that thrive on moisture, like the Kinabalu balsam. In the torrents and rivulets nearby, there's life as well, but of a stranger kind. A fish, but this is no ordinary fish. It comes right out of the water to graze on algae that cover the rocks. It's said it can even climb waterfalls. To help it keep station in these fast flowing streams, the fins beneath its body are modified to form suckers. With these suckers, it clings to the rocks, so it can feed without being swept away. The suckerfish is well equipped to compete for a living in turbulent waters. Its suckers allow it to exploit the parts that other fishes cannot reach. A green exuberance of vegetation clothes the moist and sheltered river valleys. And on the forest floor, there's a tangle of decaying branches fallen from the canopy. This damp and rotting timber provides food for a creature as bizarre as any legendary dragon. Despite its appearance, it's an adult beetle, but a kind in which the female never grows up. She retains the bodily form of a larva even when sexually mature. It's called the trilobite beetle from its superficial resemblance to the fossil trilobites. another agent of decay, the maiden's veil fungus. Below ground, root-like threads draw nutrients from the fallen leaf litter. The cap at the head of the fungus produces a putrid fluid that attracts flying insects. The net doesn't catch flies, but it may make the fungus more obvious to them, and it provides a place for them to rest when they've drunk their fill. Perhaps, too, it serves to guide them upwards to the cap of the fungus. The fluid contains the fungal spores, and the flies are agents in their dispersal. In the lowland forest to the east of Kinabalu, there are groves of giant bamboos, 20 metres high and thicker than a man's arm. The place is called Pouring, from the local name for bamboo. At Pouring, there are hot springs. 
most have been piped and enclosed to give hot baths for visitors, but this one is still in its natural state. The sulfurous waters attract butterflies. Millimeters from scalding disaster, they perch to sip the waters. The water is taken in at one end, the mineral salts are extracted, and then it's excreted again at the other. The springs attract dragonflies too, though they don't come to take the waters. Perhaps they're attracted by the other insects that come here, potential meals for a dragonfly. In the forests behind Pouring lives one of the most curious of plants. Rafflesia, the largest flower in the world. Some kinds are an arm span across. It's named after Sir Stamford Raffles, the founder of Singapore. The Rafflesia flower stinks of rotten meat. It's pollinated by flies. Male and female flowers are separate. It's a parasite of the roots of certain lianas, and it has to be the right kind of liana. Without its proper host, the Rafflesia can't survive. Much of the time, nothing is visible above ground. Indeed, the parasite's tissues are entirely enclosed within the roots of the host. But at intervals, brown cabbage-like buds appear. They swell slowly for as long as a year. Then the flower opens, withers and dies in the space of four days. This curious object is called Balanophora. Like Rafflesia, it's a root parasite, but Balanophora's flower spikes are only the length of a finger. Male and female flowers are born on separate spikes. This is the male. The flowers are much visited by ants. Just why isn't known for certain, but they may transfer pollen from the male to the female spikes. The surface of this plush protuberance is a mass of tiny female florets. The fading daylight triggers an evening chorus of birds and cicadas. This brief prelude heralds the emergence of the creatures of the night. A lantern bug. giant atlas moth.
Animals that would shrivel in the heat of the day come forth in the cool and humid darkness. A darkness lit by the eerie glow of luminous fungi. It's not known why these fungi glow in the dark, but it could be to attract insects. They sprout at dusk from rotting stems of bamboo, but within a couple of hours most have been eaten. A light meal for beetles that perhaps disperse their spores. Other beetles are eating other fungi. Emerging from tunnels in the depths of this bracket fungus, they sit warty and immobile on its surface. Yet others are the stuff of which nightmares are made. New musicians add their tunes. dawn and the nightly chanting of frogs gives way to a different chorus. Malaysian tree pie, most raucously conspicuous of the forest birds. Wreathed hornbills set out over the treetops in search of fruit. There are six kinds of hornbill on the mountain, but like the tree pie, they're birds of the lower levels. To walk up Kinabalu is to journey through a changing world of plants and animals. As you move higher, the insistent calls of the golden naped barbet become a constant companion, as they would have been to Hugh Lowe and Spencer St. John on those early journeys. The trees are changing too. The kinds they would have seen lower down are replaced by oaks and chestnuts. Beneath the canopy, stately tree ferns make their appearance. They and the many other ferns are a hint perhaps of what the world's forests may have looked like in the ages before the advent of the flowering plants. But then came flowers. These are begonias, like the ones in your garden, except that these grow almost to the height of a man. The cool middle levels of the mountain are wreathed in almost perpetual mist. Here, on the exposed ridge tops, the trees are low and twisted. 
In the valleys between, they grow taller, but in these ever-moist surroundings, all are padded and festooned with luxuriant growths of moss. It's no surprise that botanists call this the mossy forest. These dripping, moss-encrusted branches provide ideal conditions for what are, perhaps, Kinabalu's most spectacular plants, the orchids. Almost 1,500 species have been found on Kinabalu, many of them known from this one mountain alone. That's as many orchids as there are flowering plants of all kinds in the whole of Britain. Wild orchids are the raw material for the commercial orchid breeder. In the wake of Hugh Lowe and Spencer St John, Kinabalu became a mecca for plant collectors. The choicer orchids changed hands for hundreds of pounds and the forests were stripped of much of their wealth. But Kinabalu is now protected. The mountain still draws orchid enthusiasts from all over the world, but now they come to study and not to pillage. Here, you can see how these remarkable plants have come to fit in to almost every niche in the forest. The first orchids would all have lived on the ground, like this tiny helmet orchid. Its flowers are smaller than a penny piece. Since they had no special means to resist drying out, these primitive orchids would have been confined to moist situations, such as mossy banks or damp leaf litter. Another such orchid, the delicate jewel orchid, so-called from the golden filigree reticulations on its leaves. Dependence on moisture would have restricted many of the early orchids to the deep valleys of the forest streams. For here, the air is always cool and humid. But in these valleys, little light reaches the forest floor. So some orchids developed broad leaves to catch the few rays of sunshine that filter through the canopy. Species like the green slipper orchid have reduced their dependence on constant moisture by having fleshy leaves. This helps them to conserve water in dry periods. Other kinds have gone a stage further and can now live clinging to the branches high in the sometimes dry and sunny forest canopy. Done this by developing swollen leaf bases to store water, called pseudobulbs. hold onto the branches with a network of roots. And the roots too have a parchment-like coating to resist drying out. They absorb water only through their tips. Perhaps the strangest of all orchids is this curious worm-like growth. It's called teneophyllum, which means ribbon leaf, but it's lost its leaves altogether. These minuscule flowers sprout from a green root. The root performs all the functions of the missing leaves. Most orchid flowers are pollinated by various kinds of flying insect. The pollen grains are enclosed in sacs called pollinia. So, when these become attached to a visiting insect, the pollen is transferred en masse from one flower to another.
But that's not the only way the flowers can be pollinated. If you look closely into the heart of these orchids, you'll see minute beetles. The beetles are actually eating the pollen grains. Much of the pollen is destroyed, but it only needs a few grains to stick to the beetle as it moves from flower to flower for pollination to be achieved. Orchid seeds are tiny. They are dispersed by the wind. But even if they fall in a favourable place, they can germinate only with the help of a fungus. And it has to be the right kind of fungus for each orchid. The fungal threads invade the seed, but they provide the developing embryo with nutrients. Without that help, the infant orchid couldn't grow. Indeed, some orchids remain dependent on fungi even when they're mature. Some of the most spectacular orchids were first discovered here on this open grassy spur beneath the western ramparts of Kinabalu. It's called Marai Parai, the local name for the hill rice that this grass resembles. It's a total contrast to the dense forest that you see at this height elsewhere on the mountain. And that's partly because the underlying rocks are different. They weather to give a soil on which few plants can grow. And, as on other ridge tops, the soil is impoverished further by the rain washing away the scanty nutrients. So, it's not surprising that the plants here have resorted to unorthodox ways of supplementing their diet. They've become carnivorous. Sundew, a living flypaper. Its rosettes of sticky leaves trap flies in a tacky embrace. And the sundew shares Marai Parai with an even more bizarre insect eater. Nepenthes raja, giant among pitcher plants. Looking for all the world like an exotic lavatory, its bowl can hold two litres of fluid. When Hugh Lowe and Spencer St John discovered it, here on Marai Parai in 1858, they found in one pitcher a drowned rat. It's the largest pitcher plant in the world. At least nine kinds of pitcher plant grow on Kinabalu. Three of them, including the giant Raja, found nowhere else. Many were first collected by Lowe and St John on that visit in 1858. When their specimens reached London, they were described as among the most striking vegetable productions hitherto discovered. Most pitcher plants are climbers or scramblers. Their stems ramble for tens of metres through the undergrowth. The same plant can have pitchers of one kind hanging in the air and others of quite different appearance on the ground. But weird though they may be, there are some things orthodox about them. They do have flowers born on handsome spikes. female flowers on one spike and male flowers on another. So what exactly are the pitchers? They form from the tendril at the end of a leaf. Over a period of weeks it elongates and starts to form a hollow flask. Until the pitcher matures, its lid remains firmly closed, but within its pot-like belly there accumulates a slimy digestive fluid. Finally, the flask opens. 
Now, the pitcher begins to secrete a sugary nectar from cells on the undersurface of the lid and around the corrugated rim of the pot. And so the trap is set. To flying insects, the nectar, combined perhaps with the pitcher's colourful appearance, provides a fatal attraction. The nectar's not only sweet, it seems also to be highly intoxicating. Once they've fallen in, the flies drown and are digested by the liquid within the pitcher. Even if they do manage to claw their way back up the slippery walls, they face a palisade of downward pointing spikes that bars their escape. But even in this lethal fluid, there's life of a kind. Fly larvae feasting on the remains of the pitcher's victims. Surprisingly, over 80 kinds of creature have been found living in pitchers. It's usually said that they've evolved a resistance to the pitcher's digestive powers, but there could be more to the story than that. Consider the pitcher's lids and think of all that rain. Although some lids might provide an effective umbrella, with others it's a bit more doubtful. Elegant, maybe, but waterproof, perhaps not. And some lids would be downright useless. So, inevitably, the liquid in the older pitchers must become highly diluted and lose its digestive power. Flies that fell in would still drown, but they would be consumed by the creatures to which the pitcher plays host, rather than by the plant itself. But the plant might still benefit from the waste products of these uninvited guests. As you climb the mountain, you pass through a succession of pitcher plants. Each kind prefers its own level. The last pitchers are left behind at about 3,000 meters. At this altitude, the trees are low and stunted, but there are still deep pockets of soil in amongst the rocks. In these, there lives a giant blue worm. Here too is found one of the mountain's elusive mammals, the ferret badger. The ferret badger is not a badger or a ferret. Its closest relatives are the stoats and weasels. Of its habits, very little is known. It comes out mostly at night and so is seldom seen. Beyond 3,000 meters, great slabs of barren rock displace the forest. The last trees are meager and contorted. But this alpine zone isn't without life. The mountain black eye, found only in the highlands of Borneo, it's one of the few birds that goes almost to the summit of the mountain. Perhaps surprisingly, 
There are raspberries up here, one of the eight species on the mountain. These Kinabalu raspberries may one day be used to improve the cultivated breeds of raspberry. And like the ones in your garden, they have a blackbird to eat them, although here it's a mountain blackbird. Plants up here are limited not so much by the climate as by the lack of soil. The granite weathers very slowly and the few particles of soil that do form are mostly washed away by the rains. Only in crevices in the rock can soil accumulate. The last orchids find a tenuous root hold on the slabs. And so, upwards to the ice-scoured reaches of the summit of Borneo.